Good afternoon, everyone. May I have, may I have your attention, please? Uh, today's speaker is Professor Casey, Michael Casey, from the music department here at Dartmouth. Uh, professor and chair of the music department, I should say. Uh, he also works at the Bregman Music and Audio uh, Research Studio at Dartmouth, which is an interdisciplinary laboratory investigating the links between music, information, cognition, and neuroscience. He received his doctorate from the MIT Media Lab and since has held, posi has held positions as research, research scientist at Merle, uh, Cambridge. Can't read my own notes anymore. <laughs> uh, he's also professor of computer science at Goldsmiths University of London. Michael was a contributor to several MPEG standards as well and co-founder of the Online Music Recognition and Searching project in the, U in the UK, which is a collaboration between the University of London, Dartmouth College, and a number of music and internet industry partners. Uh, today he will speak to us uh, from vinyl, vinyl to YouTube, engineering the 21st century, century music industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. First of all, may I say what a pleasure it is to be invited to do the Jones Seminar, so um, I hope you enjoy. We're going to talk about the music industry in the 21st century, but we're going to start by talk, giving um, a little bit of a history lesson about where the music industry's been. We're going to talk about where it is now and how something called music information retrieval is becoming a part of the music industry, and that's really the application of signal processing, machine learning, a lot of engineering heavy kind of subjects to music, and uh, we'll talk about why that's happening. And then I'll run through a bunch of applications. On the way, I'll give a bunch of examples and applications. Some of them might even work. All right, let's talk about some history. In the 1970s, um, there was this uh, odd-looking contraption here was invented right here at Thayer. Um, who's heard of the Dartmouth digital synthesizer before here? Oh, good, a few of you. So this was a collaboration between a number of professors and graduate students here at Thayer and um, a professor in the music department. So it was uh, Sid Alonzo, Cameron Jones, and John Appleton here, here at Dartmouth, along with a number of others. And if you know any others, shout their names out now. <laughs> Pro probably a bunch more people. So it started off, the Mark I looked something like that. And the question that immediately comes to mind is, well, how do you play it? <laughs> uh, it's got some sliders at the front. And then what ended up happening was they took this prototype and they eventually turned it into a musical instrument. And let me just play you a little bit of um, video relating to this. This is a synclavier. Okay, so this is a recording studio where they recorded half of uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller album, and it was done on the synclavier. Frank Zappa used the synclavier a lot. A bunch of very famous musicians used the synclavier. It also made its way into Hollywood and became the kind of um, music sound designer, engineer's um, instrument of choice for doing soundtracks for big Hollywood movies. So that's a project that started right here at Thayer and uh, kind of went on to have a pretty significant life. Okay, so that was the Sinclair in the 70s. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the music industry. And let's look at the first million-selling artist. <laughs> and the year is 1907. Right? This guy, Enrico Caruso, an Italian tenor, sold, managed to get a, 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 over a million copies of this Vesti La, La Guba um, sold. Uh, let's hear, hear a bit of this. Okay. 
Now that's been significantly enhanced and cleaned up from the original. As you can imagine, the original was um, on a shellac surface. That word's been used a lot this week, right? <laughs> Let's not get into that. That's a whole different thing. Um, shellac surface, pre-vinyl, very brittle, very hard material. And the way that recording is made is there's a big horn that the singer sings into, and the needle is essentially directly cut, cutting onto this surface, right? Uh, it's, it's essentially a mechanical transduction. So you can imagine a lot of surface noise, a, a, a lot of uh, filtering introduced into that process, the, the, the horn affecting the sound of the voice. And what's happened here is that um, RCA Victor re-released these recordings in the 70s after a huge labor of love by an engineer called Tom Stockham, who was originally at MIT, then at University of Utah. And he worked on a technique that many of you probably know called homomorphic deconvolution. In fact, in this case, it's blind de deconvolution. And the idea was that you see in the top left there um, there's a schematic diagram of the recording process. There's a big horn, and uh, um, the signal goes in there and also comes out the other way. You play it back. Uh, the needle vi vibrates. Uh, the system's invertible. Um, and essentially, what we see here on the left is the um, on a log frequency, uh, log amplitude axis, which we use a lot in audio because it's got a lot to do with how we hear, uh, we see the broad sort of average spectrum excitation for that recording. And on the right, we see the average spec spectrum for a uh, modern recording of the same piece. And hopefully, as engineers, you'll notice that there's a, a fairly prominent um, uh, characteristic of the left-hand curve. It's on a log scale, remember, um, when compared to the right-hand curve. And, and what is that? What do you see in the left that's not in the right? Oh uh, yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a, let's see. Oh, it doesn't have the frequencies here. But let's assume the scale is uh, compatible, which it is. It's taken from the same paper. The diagram has the same scale. What about somewhere around here? Look at those two peaks, right? So those peaks are very prominent in the original recording, and those are not present in modern recording. So what Tom Stockham was able to do was to use the modern recordings of the same piece by different artists, recognizing that the voice is in the same frequency ranges, it's the same piece, same instrumentation going on, and essentially model the spectrum of how it should sound, and then take the original recordings and kind of invert the filtering that was put on by this mechanical transduction process, and then make the cleaned up recordings. Um, and actually, these recordings were then subjected to further processing where they were able to actually extract the voice of Enrico Caruso and take him away from the instruments and just have him on his own. And then again, a Dartmouth connection is that our own Charles Dodge, who was here for many years, um, made a piece called Any Resemblance is Purely Coincidental, meaning that uh, you're not supposed to know that this is actually the Caruso recording. <laughs> And there's a piano there now. The piano is new. And the original voice is left in, intact. So the orchestra has been taken mm -hmm. out. So, whoops, that's, we're getting to that later. All right, so that's kind of a little bit of history about some of the things that we've been able to do in the past. That was kind of 70s technology, 60s and 70s technology. Pretty amazing stuff. They're really great technology for cleaning up old recordings. The music industry is now about 110 or actually 115 years old. Um, and so the question is, well, where is it on its 100, 105th birthday? <laughs> All right, 100, 100, 105 years old, we, we figured, right? And so where we are now is that um, instead of seeing RCA Victor up there, what you see is a whole bunch of uh, computer companies. Right? You see Apple, um, you see Google, you see these new guys, Last FM and Pandora, the internet radio stations. And there is a particular um, way of doing business in the modern music industry that is very important. Does everyone, who here has, um, has ever listened to um, an MP3 file or downloaded one off the internet? <laughs> right. 
who, who does not have uh, an iPod or an MP3 player? Okay, if you have a mobile phone that plays MP3s, put your hand down. Who's, who's still there? Uh-huh. If you have a computer that plays MP3s, put your hand down. <laughs> okay. So we have someone over here who's, only, who's got a, a cat's whiskers wi wireless radio that he's listening to, which is, is <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, look, he, here's the issue, right? It's the scale. And 100 years ago, there was one kind of scale. You had to make a lot of these plastic things and distribute them. And now we have a different kind of scale. I mean, your mobile phone, if you're careful of how you encode stuff, probably these days hold about 1,000 media items, something like 1,000 songs. Your personal media device, like an iPod, can easily hold 10,000 songs. A record label typically has on the order, not typically, but the ones I've been working with, have on the order of about 100,000 songs in their collection that they need to manage. A download service like YouTube, um, sorry, like uh, iTunes, will have somewhere on the order of a million to 10 million items to download. And then a service like YouTube will have uh, greater than 100 million items. So there's more than 100 million videos in YouTube. In fact, it's probably more like 200 million there. And so this is the problem, right? The problem is if you want to know what's in your collection and if you want to be able to do things with it, those are very big numbers. And when you consider that that is media and it takes time as well, there may be a thousand useful chunks of media in any one of those items then you're getting into very large numbers indeed, especially if you're trying to do computational processing over it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so I feel obliged to put up a long tail picture, and because uh, this is what so many internet companies talk about. And the idea is that the old way of doing business looks like this. This is, this is Walmart. And what it says basically is that 80% um, of sales um, of uh, only 20% of available media, and it's probably even tighter than that when, when you come to Walmart. There's like 100 albums that they sell, and they sell a lot of them, right? But there's a lot more than 100 albums out there, and they don't sell them. So most people go to Walmart and buy music, right? Uh, if, if you just take you know, the average across all of America and probably across all of Europe, that's kind of, that's the reality of music sales. And it's kind of what you'd hear on any uh, ordinary radio station. I travel the country, turn it on, you'd hear something. It's probably Lady Gaga or Britney Spears or something. And it's, it's the stuff that's going to be in, in the head there. And where the modern industry is going, they reckon, or they've been trying for a long time, uh, companies like Amazon, is to kind of um, address this kind of slightly flattened curve here, which is not so much stuff in the head. It's still big, right? It's a big head. But there's a lot of stuff in this long tail. And the long tail is stuff that you don't usually find on the radio or on television. It's kind of fringy stuff. But there's a lot of you. And you've all got different interests. And if you can like, have people search for something they're interested in that means something for them and give it to them, then you're selling stuff out of the long tail. So there's a kind of an incentive from the business angle to be able to manage and understand the media that you have and to put people individually in touch with their media. And so that's where kind of the music as information comes uh, in, into play. So music as information. Well, we could look at music scores, right? But if we're talking about tens of millions of tracks of music, I mean, how many scores do we think are out there? There certainly aren't scores available for every recording. So a score essentially is music notation that describes a piece of music would be very useful from a music information perspective. Let's say we want to know what kind of melody is it, what kind of key is it in, what kind of chords does it have. Maybe I'll know if I like the piece of music if I could just look at the score. Well, maybe I could. I'm a music professor. But maybe there's other people out there too. Or maybe we could train a computer to look at a score and understand what's going on. Well, the trouble is there aren't many scores available, and they certainly don't cover music since 1940, right? So most popular music since 1940 does not exist in score form. We could go look at the music press. We could go look up New, New Music Express or Billboard or, or Music Criticism and go read about the track to see if we like it. In fact, many of us probably do that. We'll read about something in the New Yorker. We'll say, oh, that sounds good. I must listen to that. Or you'll read about it on um, Billboard or one of these sites. Another place is just generally on the World Wide Web. You go looking at blogs. You go searching around the web. See what people are saying. You might do it on Facebook. You know, what, um, my friends like this piece. Uh, of music, music, my friends like this album, I think I, I, I want to buy it. 
But then there's audio, and that is the actual recordings themselves. And if you're one of these music download services or, or a record label, you have all the audio. And the question is, what can we do with that? Given that we just talked about the history of um, audio processing a little bit, and some of the intelligent things we can do with audio from a signal processing perspective, it would kind of make sense if we could use our engineering capabilities to do signal processing and, and other kinds of pattern recognition kinds of things and maybe put people in touch with music that they're likely to want. And that's sort of one application. There are lots of other applications. All right, let's talk a little bit about the kinds of representations then. I've already mentioned um, the idea of a high-level representation. This is a score. So, so this is something that boils a piece of music down to its kind of essence and a performer could play that to you. In this case, what that is, it's a representation of a particular rhythm. Um, if, I don't know if anyone can recognize that rhythm. It's pretty, it's pretty hard, even if you read music. Uh, and the reason why is that, uh, I'll argue in a second, that's not actually representative. Um, here's the rhythm. It's a drum break here. All right, that's the most famous like four seconds in all of music, right? <laughs> um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Amen break, but a substantial part of hip hop culture and electronic music culture is based on precisely that recording and just taking that drum break and cutting it up and rearranging it. And the thing is that um, it's a, it's, it's a, it, the drum break consists of several parts, right? It's, um, this is the, the last two bars of it. I didn't sing that quite right, but there you go. <laughs> uh, but it's all written out as if it was on one instrument. You see, it's on one line. That means one instrument. But when we listen to that, the way I sing it back is that you've got to think of at least two instruments. It's the bass drum and the snare. And in fact, there's a hi-hat in there as well, and there's a cymbal. There's all this complexity that isn't represented in a single line of music notation that represents the rhythm. So if I was searching rhythm in this representation, I wouldn't be catching this, what we call the switching of the timbre, which really seems to be really important to the groove, the essence of what that is. So we need to be a bit more sophisticated than just notating where the onsets occur in that rhythm. All right, so one problem is it doesn't represent the changing sounds, OK? All right, we can represent the changing sounds. Turns out music notation's pretty uh, sophisticated technology, and we have five lines instead of one. All right, so we can notate the changing sounds like that, and it gets a bit more complicated. And now I could probably search over a representation like that and try and find things that match in, in, in that kind of multi-tambral space. And I'd probably be doing better. I'd be finding things that use the same groove or use the same pattern if I wanted to find things that have that groove. Problem is that this representation turns out from an engineering perspective from audio to be actually completely impossible to extract. Right? I mean, if you think about it, it's sort of like going back to the speech recognition days, being able to take someone saying anything, like me gibbering away right now, and get a perfect transcription of it. Okay? This is the transcription problem. We're trying to listen to a piece of audio and get a beautiful symbolic notation of the audio that makes sense to a musician. It's completely impossible. It doesn't work. People have been trying it for years. In fact, this has got the nickname. Um, the transcription problem is the, the rocks on which many a PhD hopes have been dashed. So there you go. <laughs> uh, partri partial transcription sort of takes it um, where here's a rhythm. And you can see these lines, these vertical lines. They're, they're not just time markers. They're actually indicating where we feel the beat. Right, so that is not quite where the onsets are in the rhythm, but it's where we feel this higher level phenomenon of a beat. It's where you tap your foot. It turns out we can do an okay job of extracting these things, because there's um, you essentially do an autocorrelation on a subband representation of the time flow of the spectrum, and there's kind of periodicity in this beat, right? So you can kind of figure out that you could pull that out. It turns out that you do OK at extracting beats. You get octave errors, two, two to one errors a lot. I might beat too slow, or I might beat too fast, right? Um, but it's not very reliable. And it turns out that having these hard decision boundaries on where to put beats and where to put onsets um, is, is very problematic. It depends a lot on the sound. If I have a sound like a violin with a soft attack, 
it's going to be harder to make a decision as to where there's an onset. Right? It makes sense. All right. So what we do instead, a lot of music information retrieval that's based on extracting information out of audio signals does something that's like what we call mid-level feature extractors. Right? We're not trying to extract music notation. A, it's impossible. B, we're not sure it solves the problem when we get there. What we're going to do instead is we're going to take a, a spectrogram type representation, a time frequency representation of the audio in regular slices, typically about 20 or 30 millisecond slices. Each slice covers about um, a quarter of a second of, of the audio, and then you advance by 20 or 30 milliseconds. Kind of like in speech, they do this a lot. And we're going to use the spectrum. Why are we using the spectrum? Because that's sort of what the ear uses, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to do, starting with Fourier transforms, we go, or, or a filter bank representation at least. Fourier transform isn't actually the best thing to use, but it's, it's, it's a quick thing to use because of the fast Fourier transform algorithm. We're going to use a filter bank type representation, get these frequency bands out of our audio signal, and we're going to look at these different bands and look at what's going on in these different bands, and we're going to extract certain information out of it. And the kind of information we can extract, I'll, I'll, I'll get into now. Here's one kind of information. One kind of information is the, uh, so this is, believe it or not, a, a spectrogram representation of the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And if you think really hard, you might be able to remember how that goes. All right, so, so if I just point to it, it goes, um, look at the top. Uh, it's hard to see, but there are these vertical striations at the beginning. There's three of them, there's four of them. Ba, 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 long pause, off. Ba, 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 long pause, and then it goes into a bunch of and then it comes back with a chung, chung, chung. You can see that easily, right? So that's Beethoven's fifth. And the representation below it is no longer just a spectrum. This is something that's been pulled out of the spectrum. And what this represents is if we label the keys on a piano in one octave, with the numbers 1 through 12, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, et cetera, all the way up to B again, right? We get, well, all, all, yeah, all, all the way up to the first octave. Then we can, we can look for how much energy from each pitch class is represented in that spectrum. And then we can get a picture that kind of shows us roughly what the type of chord is being played, all right? So that's a way of mapping a spectrum into something that looks a little bit, it's like a soft coding, it's a noisy coding, but it is a coding of the pitch content. Right? So now I can see that there's two distinct chords in the opening, right? Um, da, 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 da. And then again, two, two more distinct chords, da, 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 da. we see the changes. Then a bunch of stuff happens, then we get these three big chords at the end. Okay? Um, so that's how we get a, if you like, two-dimensional pitch class profile that we call a chroma se sequence. To turn it into a sequence, what we do is we take some range of that, and instead of treating it as a two-dimensional image, right, we, we take some portion, which I've drawn the lines in, and we actually just join, we stack the columns end-to-end -end as one long vector. And now what we're doing is, essentially, this is the same information, but it's showing how it evolves in time. We have a signal that's showing how these pitch class profiles evolve in time. Now I can do things like match filtering, good old radar detection type stuff, right? Um, is if, if I can find a sequence of chord changes that looks a little bit like this, then I might be able to find music has the same harmony pattern in it, even if it isn't the same instruments, even if it isn't the same rhythm, has the same harmony, because I've just extracted the harmony from the spectrum. So these are the kind of things we're doing. We're not trying to do musical notation. We're trying to find signals that represent the kinds of things that humans hear in music. Here's a mid-level representation that actually breaks apart the sound into different sounds, in, into different parts. So it's a bass drum, a snare, a hi-hat. And what we see at the top are the kind of fr average frequency profiles over the A men break, over the few seconds of the A main break, of four different sounds that this algorithm found in there. And what we see on the bottom are the rhythms associated, represented again as a signal. We don't have music notation, we don't have just a list of onsets, we have a signal. And this is very convenient representation for a lot of reasons I'll describe later. But basically we can match directly on this signal in various ways and see if we can find other music that has one or other of these different either sounds or rhythms in it, or, or multiple of them. If we have multiple of them that match well, we've probably got a good match to our original group. All right, so this is actually breaking the sound into its components. 
I sound is mixed, all these things are mixed together, we're breaking them apart here. And then there's always good old, right, very low level representations. Why don't we just take the energy envelope of the signal and look at that? Okay. And so some, sometimes that actually does better than um, trying to do things like onset detection and stuff like this. And as engineers, you, you, you know this, right? If you try to be too clever in your representation, things break. You know, just go back to the simple stuff, just work on it really carefully, and usually things work better. One way that we're going to do audio sequence matching is let's say, I have some of these features I've extracted. I have a little patch of these features. These happen to be something called Mel frequency capstrel coefficients that represent the way something sounds, the timbre, if you like. I have a little patch of them. Let's say I have a database, and this, this thing re represents a whole bunch of pieces that are strung end to end in a database, and I want to find the best match. So what I do is I take my little patch and I slide it along. I just basically do a cross product. I just multiply between that patch and the, and, and the database image. And then I move it along and kind of multiply and sum, move it along, multiply and sum. And I generate this curve, this correlation curve. And here's the worst possible place. <laughs> it doesn't match at all. And, and here's, here's where it matches, right? So you just you basically get a, a correlation coefficient that describes, as in, in a database sweep, how your feature matches the database. This, this is kind of a simplistic explanation, but it gives you an idea of the kinds of things that we do. Um, Let's talk about um, robust audio identification now, because we've talked about kind of the general principles of extracting signals out of music, but now let's talk about some applications. How does this stuff that I just talked about find its way into real make you some money industry? Right? Okay, well, I'm going to try and give a live demo of something. Let's see if this works. It involves MATLAB. <laughs> But actually, MATLAB isn't doing the heavy lifting here. What I've got is the Shazam um, music service running here. Has any, anyone used Shazam or know what it is? Oh, you've used it. OK, great. Um, can someone tell me what you understand Shazam as doing? Yeah, you've used it. <laughs> Right, so a song can be playing, but a song can be playing in a room like this this room, right? Through some speakers with the noise of the crowd, probably dancing away in a club and chatting away. And you can turn your mobile phone on and say, tag this song, and it'll listen to that noisy room and pick out the music in it, and it will identify it. So it identifies it in the presence of an, an extreme amount of noise. So we're going to do an experiment here. So, so first of all, we're going to be quiet, and we're going to do it, see if it works. And then we're going to be not so quiet, and we're going to do it, see if it works, all right? So here's, so what I do is I basically say, I turn on my phone here, yep, and I say, tag now. I hit tag now. Lucky Star by Madonna. So it got it, right? It got it right. So that's good. It's speakers in a room. There's a lot of echo. Humans can't hear the echo because of the precedence effect, which basically means the brain suppresses echoes. Um, now let's try it. Imagine you're at a cocktail party or you're dancing in a club. And what I want you to do is have a conversation with your neighbor. <laughs> uh, hopefully, yeah, not, not, not too noisy. But how about you just like start talking and maybe you know just reciting some poetry or something and we'll try and do the same thing. All right, you ready? Okay, just yeah, that's right. Just keep chatting. And it got it. Hey, it worked. <laughs> Oh, just, just just verify that that is in fact Madonna's lucky star. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well done. So so it works. Shazam works. Now, if any of you have ever worked on any signal processing in the presence of noise, you know you start with the idea of noise as this um, smooth distribution, right? Um, there was nothing smooth about what you just did. That was like a hundred conversations going on simultaneously, um, and quite a, a, a low signal to noise ratio. And yet, this was able to very quickly look it up in a central database in essentially in California, probably, and send, send back the answer, even in the presence of all, all that, that noise. 
So this stuff really works. Um, and oft, often we don't just want to identify an exact recording. What we might want to do is detect recordings that are similar to this one. So it might be, I don't like Lucky Star by Madonna, but I know that Franz Ferdinand did a cover of it. He didn't, they didn't, but you know, let's say they did. And actually, I want that, that one. Um, so near duplicates, or I want the live version, not the studio version, or I want a bootleg from uh, the Worcester Centrum, or you know, there's all these different ways of being kind of like that, but not exactly the same signal, right? Um, the thing about these systems is they've got to be robust to additive interference, which is things like sounds from bars and clubs and the outdoors and other stuff going on, the environment. Um, also, convolutive interference, there's a room response going on in here. And they also need to be robust to time and frequency scaling. If I'm a DJ in a club, I may play the record a bit slower or faster, right? Um, and robust to encoding distortion. This phone is a GSM phone. You don't know what's been done to that signal unless you've studied GSM, right? It's, it's basically had um, LPC coefficients extracted from it and sent down the line. So. Um, there's, there's a lot going on to, uh, to distort the signal, and yet Shazam still works. So how does Shazam work? Well, luckily, Avery Wang, who was the uh, formerly at Stanford PhD around uh, 1994, worked on source separation techniques that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, he invented this technique that Shazam uses. So the top left is a time frequency, with frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And this is a piece of music. You can see that there are these regular vertical stripes. That means it's got beats in it. And you can see there are these little patches that correspond to kind of notes. You can see notes running up and down, and maybe chords. If you see these kind of dark spots that are on simultaneously vertically and they continue, those are chords. OK, so what he does is, first of all, they do some peak picking. They say, well, where are the kind of dark spots? I would say bright spots, but we've inverted the spectrogram. The dark spots in this spectrogram, where, where, are, the, where are the places if, I'm, if, if, if I have the original audio file, this isn't in the presence of noise. I have the original audio file. Where, where, are the, where are the points of highest energy, the peaks? And then what they do is they, for any one of these points, they choose one, essentially at random. And then they look at its near neighbors. And then they, they, they look at the time frequency location of the point and its near neighbors. And they make what's called a hash out of those two values. It's the position, essentially, in that image they make a hash of those peaks. And they do that for, for a bunch of locations within a song. And now what they can do is, in the presence of noise, if you have a noisy recording, you're still going to have those peaks there, but you have a lot of other peaks too. So if you pick a bunch of peaks at random, some of those peaks are going to match the hash function that's in your database. And if you get enough of those over a 20-second clip, which is about what we played there, then you have evidence that you have the right track. And hashing is a way to do a fast lookup of a match, and I'll talk, talk about it a little bit. That's essentially what they're doing. The functions are basically hash functions based on picking pairs of these peaks in the spectrum. So conventional hashing, this is essentially what Shazam does, is that you want to map features, and it could be points on a, um, in, in an image, onto uh, an integer line, onto, on, onto some kind of list of numbers. So let's say numbers in the range 0 to 4, 4 billion, 32-bit hash. And um, what you want that to do is, for any two, two pairs, you want, them, you want some mathematical operation that will take the numbers, like the time frequency locations, add them up, maybe mash them around a bit, and just generate some number. You don't really care which number it generates. What you do care is that the number is as unique as possible to that, that pair. So then it puts it in a slot. And so the idea is then, when you're looking later um, at a different image with noise in it, if you find two points that hash to the same slot using this mathematical function that generates an integer for a feature, if they hash to the same slot, you've got a match. All right? and, the, and the reason why they do this, if you look, this a big O notation basically tells you it, 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 in perfect hashing, it maps what essentially is a linear scan. Instead of having to visit every bucket to see if you have a match to all the items in your database. Remember, 10 million songs, each with 1,000 parts, 10 billion buckets to look in. That's, that's going to take a long time to scan through. What this does is generates a number that tells you where to go look to see if you have a match in one step. That's why it's an order one operation instead of order n, where n is the size of the database. In reality, it's, it's order um, k times 1, where k is the constant of how many hashes you're looking up. All right, so you're using multiple hashes to solve this problem. All right, let's talk a bit about specificity, because this is a very important issue. 
So all the way over at the left, we're doing things like fingerprinting. We're trying to find an exact match, and that's what Shazam's doing. It's important that it was a specific recording of Lucky Star by Madonna that we matched. It wasn't a cover version. It wasn't the instrumental version. It wasn't the Spanish version, right? It, it wasn't the radio edit, or it wasn't the, um, it, it wasn't a, um, uh, a, a remix of some kind. So it was an exact match, and it required to be, because our hashes really depend somewhat on preserving the temporal structure of the signal, even though it has noise added from the cocktail party that's going on. The original signal is still there intact. That's very important. Okay. Then we move to the right of the specificity spectrum, and we get to things like remixes and sampling. Sampling is the process where we take something like the Amen break, and we build a new track around it. We put a new bass line, we put new vocals, we put new chords. Same drum beat. It's actually the same recording, but it's had a lot of other stuff added to it. And it's, it's, it's a ton of stuff. It's not even like a cocktail conversation. It's a lot of other musical stuff, probably drum layers as well. And so now we're sampling. And we have to change our strategy a bit, because we're not looking for an exact copy of the signal now. We've distorted the signal in all kinds of ways. And then we get to this, what I call the audio music semantic gap. And then we're no look longer looking for the same signal even. Right? Sampling, you still have the same signal somewhere embedded in the mix. When you get to the idea of a cover song, um, Johnny Cash singing Hurt, not Trent Reznor, um, that's no longer the same signal. There's no part of that recording that shares a signal in common with the original. Two different artists singing at two different times, two different studios, two completely different recordings, different speeds, different keys, different instrumentation. What do they have in common? Well, the chord sequence probably at some points is going to be in common. The melody probably at some points is going to be in common. These are musical concepts. They're not signal, they're not acoustic concepts. So we cross this kind of semantic gap, and now we're having to match properties that are musical, but we still represent them as signals and match them in that way. And then we go along to, like, I want to know the same artist, or is it the same genre, or even is it music or is it an image? It gets very generic. The least specific, right? So the most specific matches up there, least specific down there. All of these different systems are possible. And we have to design our system differently depending on where we are on this specificity spectrum. We need completely different strategies depending on where we are. So this is the work of the kind of music engineer, if you like, in the modern music industry. They've got to figure out, well, what are we trying to do? Where are we on this spectrum? What features do we need? What things do we need to be able to ignore? Which things are we invariant to? And which things are we sensitive to? All right, and so that's essentially your engineering strategy. Let me give you an example of something that is um, kind of not quite like the Shazam example, but it's a bit more uh, of a re remix example. This might be loud, so I'll turn it down. <laughs> So this is an original piece by ABBA, right? Gimme, gimme, gimme. And then spot the similarity in the Madonna track. Two, three, four. So Madonna takes the ABBA stuff, takes just the kind of flute riff and uh, throws everything else away, builds a whole new track around it. In fact, it probably isn't even the original flute riff. It's probably just re-recorded to sound like it. It might be, but it may not be. Um, and then other artists come along and remix Madonna. It's a dance remix. And so there we get something that's similar to the Madonna track. It doesn't have the ABBA in it, uh, but it has completely different drum beat behind it. And then we get kind of the extremes of remixing where it's... So as you can see, um, there are these relationships in music, but it's, it's, it's not clear where the relationships are going to be. And in some applications, you're going to want to know that it's a remix, or it's a cover, 
or that this samples another song, very important in audio forensics or uh, copyright infringement kind of cases and stuff like that. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. All right. So as we get more and more away from the idea of exact matching, where we have an exact signal, and we cross that semantic gap and we get more and more into the idea of we're trying to match things that have something musically in common, we need to change our strategy. And this is where kind of a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last five years sort of kicks in, is that um, we can no longer rely on the idea of an exact hash, right? That there's a slot, there's a mathematical function that will give us a slot where the thing we're trying to match will end up in that slot, and we can just, just do this very quick lookup and it will be there. So we've got to use this new concept, a relatively new concept, called locality sensitive hashing. And it's a whole range of algorithms that do this. And the idea is that you can control how, how sensitive these hash slots are to having items placed in them. So essentially, you can control how big the bucket is. Right? Imagine um, I have a room full of buckets, and I'm throwing ping pong balls. If the buckets are bigger, then there's fewer of them, but I'm going to get more ping pong balls in each bucket. If they're small, I'm going to get fewer ping pong balls in each bucket, but there's more of them. All right? So it's this trade-off that, that we can do. And it turns out that we don't get the nice order one lookup that we had with a hash, which is, has a constant in front of it, because we're doing multiple hashes. But we do actually get this thing, which is a uh, seeth root of n, which is the size of the database, and where c is an approximation factor. This is sort of, um, we're going to allow a certain amount of uh, false positives to enter into the equation. We usually set that around 1%. So let's say each track has a, has a thousand bits to it, uh, a, a thousand um, uh, data points that, that we're trying to match. We're probably taking just a few of those, let's say 100, um, that, that we're actually trying to find in this track. And what we're going to say is that 1% uh, of those, so one of them we're going to allow to be wrong, and the others have, have, have to be right. Okay? So every so often we're going to get a false positive. But it doesn't matter, because we're going to look at the overall balance of how many matches we got in the track to determine if it is a near neighbor in some sense. So we're changing our sense of, uh, of, of, of hashing to, to admit a probabilistic interpretation of, of hashing. So it changes the math quite a bit, but it works kind of like this. So we're using the idea of random projections, right? So instead of using the kind of traditional hash functions, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a random list of numbers, and we're going to multiply that random list of numbers by our feature, and add them all up, and we're going to truncate that. We're going to make it an integer, and that's going to be our hash slot. Uh, how does projecting against a random vector help us? But what we do is we do several of these. And I've represented, look, I've got three-dimensional data on a sphere. The two red balls are near each other. And there's actually two green cubes that are not near each other. That's the idea. And they're somewhere in three-dimensional space. And so the idea is I want to do these random hashes. And it turns out that these random projections down to the real line from a high-dimensional space, it's only three-dimensional here, down to the real line, it turns out if, if you do the right kind of projection against the right kind of distribution, Two items that are close together in the high dimensional space, after projection against a random vector, have a known probability of being near each other in the one dimensional projection. So it means you have a hash bucket that you've projected down from a high dimensional space. Typically, we have thousands of dimensions in our features, not, not three dimensions. But with a higher, uh, with a, a, a known probability, with a probabilistic guarantee, Items that are close together in the high dimensional space will remain close together when projected down to low dimensions. And, and the probability of them hitting the same hash slot tapers off as a known probability distribution. We have a probabilistic guarantee, which means we can design our algorithms with known properties. So let's look at the, We do multiple of these to control the false positive rate, basically. So let's look at how this, why this works. It turns out it's due to a property of certain distributions that means they're p-stable. And it turns out that for the Euclidean norm, which is a standard Euclidean distance, um, the Gaussian distribution is p-stable. What that means is it preserves, with a probabilistic guarantee, distance relationships in high dimensions when projecting using random vectors down to one dimension or low dimensions. This is a very useful property. And I've drawn it here as 
imagine you have two points, um, x and y. They're both in a uh, hundred, a uh, thousand dimensional space, it says in the top. So I have 2,000 dimensional vectors. And basically what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to add a little bit of noise to one of them, x. Right, so the x is very much like x plus epsilon. And I'm going to do this random projection against both of them, the same set of random vectors. And it turns out that the distribution of where they end up being on the real line is very narrow. Now I'm going to take two points that are not near each other. And I'm going to do this uh, projection multiple times. Um, x and y. I'm going to use the same set of random vectors and project them down. I'm going to do it hundreds of times so I can do a distribution. It turns out that the distribution of where they end up is very wide. So what this is expressing is we've preserved the Gaussian distribution of the random vectors, but it's scaled by how far apart those points are. All right, so that's, that's the stability of this dis distribution. This is a really important fact for scaling up multimedia search systems or music information re retrieval systems. Here's how random projection works. Let's rotate that sphere. Right? In lots and lots of rotations of that sphere, which are essentially random projections, I'm projecting a three-dimensional sphere to two dimensions, right? Everyone agree? Um, in, in lots of rotations of that sphere, the two red dots are still close together, right? In, in most rotations, the two green boxes are still far apart. In a few rotations, it breaks, OK? But in most rotations, right, random projections, the two red dots are going to be close to each other. That's why this works. Turns out that um, this is exactly what Google do for YouTube. So if you try to upload a Madonna video to YouTube, it will get rejected. Even if you try to distort the Madonna video in some way, it'll get rejected. Right? You should try this. Like how much distortion to the audio or the video do you have to do to get it onto YouTube? That's a great experiment. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do it right now. I'd love to, I'd love to see the answer. It's like, what's the threshold of it not getting into YouTube? But they basically do, they, they take a time frequency spectrum, they do a wavelet decomposition, and then they do this locality sensitive hashing. They don't use strictly random projections. They actually learn um, some hash functions that have particular properties that they're looking for. It turns out that a lot of the work that I've been doing um, over the last few years has applications in this new field called uh, forensic musicology. And we built a system that we're, where we took every known recording of the Chopin mazurkas from, for, for all time. So this is for the whole 20th century, from around the turn of the century or, all the way through the 20th century. So that ended up being about seven or 8,000 of them. There are about 250 different artists playing the same collection of 49 published mazurkas by Chopin. Well, why would we want to do that? Well, it's great. It's like you can compare the way that different artists play the same set of pieces. And now we can start to understand something about how performers approach playing music, or we can understand something about trends in music performance over the 20th century. In fact, something very unexpected cropped up. <laughs> And it became known as the Hattogate scandal. Um, and that's, uh, does anyone know about this? Anyone heard of Joyce Hatto? I actually gave a talk on this a couple of years ago in CS, so no one came back for more. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, <laughs> Joyce Hatto is, um, is a pianist, concert pianist. William Barrington Coop is a record producer who happens to be her husband. And this is a guy called Sergei Fiorentino, who we'll get to in a minute. But basically, Joyce Hatto, she was a concert pianist, and toward the end of her life, he wanted to record all her concert works on a piano in a concert hall uh, with high-quality recordings and put them out. Turns out, for one reason or another, due to illness, the recordings weren't up to scratch. And what he decided to do, he, uh, as, as he claimed, he, he, he did this for his wife because he didn't want to break her heart. He released the recordings anyway, except they weren't her recordings. What he did, he fished around in all the 20th century recordings of the same pieces and found uh, some of the less well-known artists and re-released those recordings as if they were her playing. Now, you would need uh, to own several thousand recordings of the same pieces in order for, to identify that you actually have the same recording, right? And you'd have to listen to them side by side to know. So it took a while for people to catch on that this was going on. Gramophone magazine uh, received these recordings with critical acclaim. This is like the, the highest of, of the high of audiophile magazines, right? They originally received these recordings with critical acclaim, gave them great reviews, but it turns out they were forgeries. They were actually other people playing. And not only that, but they were sophisticated forgeries. 
that the sound had been altered so that even if you listen to them side by side, you can't immediately tell it's the same recording. Right? What you have to do is a very detailed analysis of the timing structure of the spectrum to see that they're the same signal. In fact, the kind of thing that Shazam does is a great way to solve the uh, Hattergate scandal. So we did a bunch of these because we were approached by a couple of musicologists from the Center for the History and Analysis of Recorded Music. And they said, we found a bunch of these coincidences, but we have no way to quantify the extent to which these are the same recordings. And so what we did is we took our system that's based on hashing and doing the similarity matching and all the rest of it, and we just took all 8,000 recordings and did a cross product to see how, how many hit each other. And sure enough, we found not only was it Joyce Hatto, William Barrington Coop said, I did this for my wife. She was in ill health. I wanted to get her recordings out there. But there were actually a whole bunch of other artists that he'd released recordings of that were not actually due to those artists as well. And one of them is this guy, Sergio Fiorentino. So we found a bunch of recordings. And there were three other artists whose uh, work had been ripped off there. Um, when we do this kind of thing on a large scale, we want to scale it up to millions of tracks. We need to use these hashing techniques. And one thing we want to know is how well do they perform compared to just doing brute force, non-hashing, just computing the distance? Because you're going to get a degree of approximation. And it turns out if you set the parameters just right, which means setting the radius of the buckets and doing the right number of projections and stuff, it turns out that it performs almost exactly as well as the exact near neighbor. All right, there's very little error introduced if you get the right parameters. If you don't get the right parameters, then you end up on the, on the lower slopes of this, this graph. All right, let's just do a couple of other things on the um, application front. So one that you might have heard of is the idea of searching for music using your voice. And I don't know if I have a volunteer. Does anyone want to come up here and sing uh, as part of the song? <laughs> Please tell me I don't have to do this. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn the microphone off and do this, all right? Um, um, I'm going to do Madonna's Get Into the Room. And somehow, just the sound of me singing that melody is matching a recording that has all this other stuff going on in it. So how are they doing that? Um, and basically, they have to match a melody in context. You have to extract the predominant melody from the mixture in the recording. And you have to use um, the same kind of sequence alignment kind of matching that we were doing before to do that. Trouble with this kind of technique is, is uh, as a way of searching for music, it's, I don't think it's terribly effective because you have to already know the song that you're searching for to do this. And it's like, well, I can just type the name of the song, I suppose. Or maybe you just know the melody. You can actually hum. You don't need to sing the lyrics. You can just hum it. So maybe you know the melody, but you don't know what the song is. There's where it's useful, right? So it's the stuck, stuck song syndrome. There's a tune in my head. I don't know what it is. Go to Medomi. You'll find out. Maybe. <laughs> All right, so that's query by humming. So to do this kind of thing, we've got to work with mixed audio. And this is sort of the final part of the presentation here, is what do we do about mixed audio? So we've really been talking about audio as if it was just one signal. But really, there's lots of signals added together. And if we do our processing that recognizes that fact, then we can probably do a lot better. Or we could do new things that we couldn't do if we just treat audio as a mixed signal. All right? So we can get further down the to the center of that specificity spectrum. That's the idea. Um, so. This is where the area of blind signal separation comes in. And this is something that's related to array processing and all, all kinds of um, uh, techniques that are well known to people who, who work with multi-sensor multi processing. But the basic idea is that you have a matrix factorization problem where there's um, a set of observations, there's a row of them. And let's say, for simplicity for now, there's row sources. But those sources have been mixed together in a linear fashion. There's a linear mixing matrix of full rank, meaning there's no singularities in that, that matrix. So, so they're linearly independent rows in this case. And the idea is, in theory, I should be able to find the inverse mixing matrix that, when applied to the observed signals, 
right? These four, six, four different microphones in a room with four different talkers, right? Um, I should be able to recover the uh, non-interfering original six signals. And uh, this is solved by an algorithm known as independent component analysis. I don't have time to get into it. But it turns out that doesn't really help us for music. And so what we did instead is we took similar kind of machinery but applied it to a time frequency distribution, recognizing that each of the frequency channels is, in a sense, an independent observation of the underlying signal. It's just it, it, it happens not to overlap in frequency, right? And so the idea is that if, if your multiple signals that are mixed together uh, are out of each other's way in the frequency spectrum, then the same mathematics should be able to solve decoupling or separating the different parts of the spectrum into its different musical instruments and, and voice, for example. And so we did this, and it, we got a certain amount of success with it. Um, there are some more recent algorithms that do this in a kind of more probabilistic way. But basically, it always ends up being the same thing. You have a factorization of a spectrogram that looks a bit like a singular value decomposition or principal component analysis, but the math underneath it is higher order. It's not second order. I can play you what this sounds like, because um, I have the same lucky star. This is the original. So there's the instrumental background. And then Madonna's voice is going to come in. All right. And so what we did was we took the first part of that and we trained um, a, a system that basically learned the different instruments and the different components in the spectrum factoring. And then what we did is we applied those learned components to the second part and said, only preserve the, the parts of the spectrum that match the components we learned in the first part, and that will remove the voice. So what we're going to hear is the second part that originally had the voice, but with the voice removed using this technique. So there's none of the voices in there. Madonna's been removed. You can hear it kind of dipping up and down where her voice comes in. Incidentally, ducking is a technique used in music production. The spectrum probably does duck when the voice comes in. That's kind of a music production technique. All right, so those are the kinds of things we're looking at now is actually doing source separation. And it turns out we do this kind of thing so that we can do um, search by groove. Um, I'll play you some examples. We essentially give a database of thousands of tracks um, the amen break, and we, and we do the source separation thing to get the percussion components. And then we only search in the track using the drums and look to see where the rhythms match using techniques that I've discussed here. And uh, that sounds like this. Here's the original amen break. We're looking for the groove, right? Got a bit chaotic. Here's, here's the second result. And here's the third result. I'll play the original again so you can hear it. This is the groove we're listening for. And here. I'm sure you'll agree there's a pretty similar groove going on. Even though the song is different, there's different stuff going on around it, the source separation technique allows us to match the groove. All right, so finally, the take-home message from this is when we do this with a proper experiment and we look at it, we, we do quite well. Um, the take-home message is that what we're doing in the music industry in the 21st century is stuff at a very large scale. There are millions of items. There's hundreds of millions of uh, items in YouTube. Um, it's really important to understand the signal and its composition and to try and model it. And we think that this idea of extracting separated features and working in the separated domain, but still working on signals that have property, musical properties is important. And we've had a certain degree of success doing that. Um, we think these latent kind of subspace separation techniques work better than trying to do a transcription to a score or just using something like the RMS envelope, which just doesn't work. And um, we, we got the best metric for similarity analysis when we did this in a bunch of experiments. All right. 
So that's it. Thank you to my colleagues at Bregman, and I'll take any questions. Yeah, yeah. So this is a subject of a lot of research. Different norms or different distance metrics have different p-stable statistics. It turns out that the L1 is couchy. And um, it also turns out that if you're doing something like cobach liebler divergence or earth movers distance, which usually operates, it's a distance between distributions, not just between points. Um, it turns out that there's a technique for embedding the um, distributions themselves into an L1 metric and then solving it with the Cauchy. So there's a lot of research that, that looks at exactly that, that issue. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. So MIDI stands for the Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And it's essentially a bunch of control signals that tell notes when to switch on and off on a digital instrument. And so it's a score-like representation, because a score tells musicians when to switch notes on and off on different parts. And so really, I would say that my dis a discussion on MIDI is subsumed into a discussion on using notation. It's the same thing. It's a symbolic representation of music. And it suffers from the same problem, where there just aren't MIDI there isn't MIDI data available for the millions of audio tracks that are out there. But where there is MIDI uh, uh, data available, yeah, you can use it. You can use it in the same way you can use a score, and it's very useful. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So obviously, for brevity, I've, I've left out kind of um, a, a, a very large subset, <laughs> which is probably a superset of, um, of ev everything else in MIR. And one of them is um, not using audio-derived features, but using human-entered data. And Pandora uses musicians to make a feature vector that has certain properties, like soft male vocals or soft female vocals or angular rhythms and things like this, but it needs to be human entered. And so they do about 50,000 tracks a year. After eight years, they've got to the scale of about a million tracks. It's going to take them a long time to get to the scale of 10 million. So what Pandora are looking at trying to do, because if you listen to Pandora for a long time, you'll just hear the same tracks over and over again for a given channel. So that they need to scale in order to get more stuff into the mix. So what they're trying to do is to join up the way they do things with these content-based techniques so that they can expand their operation, essentially. So that's kind of on ongoing work. So, so this is the like yeah, but it's not standard song metadata. It's not like rock and pop. It actually is very specific musical information about the track. Like, like the kind of feel it has, kind of instruments that are playing in it, the sort of rhythms that it has, described by a very simple uh, measure, just a simple number. Yeah. 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 Yes. No, it's the same set of random projections. So, so, so what you do is you choose a set of random projections for your system. 
and then everything's subject to those random projections. Yeah. Thank you very much.